All right, guys, it's like the end of our contemporary economics unit, looking at the economics of the center left and the center right. Of course, we're not looking at what they do in a communist society or in a fascist society, because most societies aren't communist or fascist. Uh, but what we did is we did a quick survey of um, controlled economies, right? Keynesian economies versus uh, more laissez-faire economies. And on the screen here, we have uh, a T-chart that has some terms that we should know from the unit. I just want to review them, go through them with you uh, before we move you on to your exam, your multiple choicer for this particular uh, unit of study. So we'll start with the left, right? With the moderate left, with modern liberal economies, as it says up here. Uh, so one term you should definitely know would be Keynesian economics. And of course, guys, remember Keynesian economics is named after the man, John Maynard Keynes. His economics, uh, his ideas about how to have a prosperous economy are basically embraced by every nation in the world, right? For the most part. I mean, there's bits and pieces that you'll maybe see uh, in, you know, different countries. But for the most part, every country uh, embraces aspects of Keynesian economics. Remember, guys, during that boom bust cycle that we talked about where the economy goes up and the economy goes down, Keynes says the job of government is to be very much hands on and steer that economy. So we have a nice, slow, sustained, measured growth curve over time, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to avoid the extremes of the boom and then the depression that we see during a bust. And I mean economic and also mental depression. So that's Keynesian economics. Remember guys, Keynes says during a boom, right? We need to slow it down. During a bust, we need to pick it back up. So when the economy is busting, we lower taxes, we lower interest rates, and we create uh, deficit spending jobs, right? We spend money on infrastructure. When the economy is doing too well, when it's taking off too quickly, when we want to slow it down, when we're in a boom period, we increase prime lending rates to slow down spending. We increase taxation to build that nest egg so that when the bust happens, we have money to spend. And we also stop spending money on infrastructure, right? We use something called like austerity measures, which is more of a rightist idea, but nonetheless, we see spending slow down during times of booms. So that's Keynesian economics. Now, demand side economics, another term we should know. Demand side economics refers to the idea that we need to create demand in the economy to have a healthy economy. And really guys, a lot of these terms you just need to be aware of whether they are leftist or rightist. Now, tax spend cycle. During times of bust, we spend money. During times of boom, we tax and gain money so that we can spend it during those uh, bust periods, right? And sometimes Keynesian economics is referred to as the tax spend cycle. So in there, invariably, as the economy goes down and up, we tax and then we spend and then we tax and then we spend and we go boom and bust, tax, spend, boom, bust over and over and over again. Um, now, this idea of boosting aggregate demand when you have a bus situation, Keynes says what we must do is prime the pump of the economy. And we do that by boosting aggregate demand. We boost demand in society by very calculated steps, lowering interest rates, um, lowering taxes, and spending on infrastructure job creation programs, aka uh, things like the New Deal, right? Or Canada's Economic Action Plan, or the CERB that we're seeing right now, right? These are all examples of the government attempting to boost aggregate demand. What they're trying to do is make sure that the economy doesn't flatline. Um, Keynesian economics is also known as economic interventionism, right? Interventionism means to intervene. To intervene means to get involved. And that's what we see with the 
uh, left when it comes to their economic policy. And then I mentioned before uh, this idea of Keynesian pump priming, right? We get the engine of the economy going by uh, injecting some good old government stimulus into it. And of course, we see that government stimulus with uh, when we look at the subprime mortgage crisis with the so-called bailout, the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, where the U.S. government pumped $800 billion into the economy at that time. It ended up being almost a trillion dollars. Now, why did they do that? If you let businesses fail, instead of give them a bailout, then it will have a sweeping effect on the economy, right? You'll have people lose their jobs. If people lose jobs, they'll stop spending money. If people stop spending money, the economy is going to slow down even more and it will be like the Great Depression all over again, right? So that's Keynesian pump priming. Give it that stimulus that it needs. That's me pumping a or priming a uh, pump um, on a two-cycle gas-powered weed trimmer. If you've never used one, the metaphor is lost on you. Um, but yeah, YouTube it. You'll check it out right? It gets the engine going. Okay, um, so that's the left. On the right, there's a lot more stuff that we need to talk about here. Chicago School of Economics and Austrian School of Economics right here, right? Uh, the dominant American school in the 1980s that was all about laissez-faire free markets. The Austrian school came before it. And again, uh, the dominant uh, school in Europe that preached uh, laissez-faire, capitalist, free market, non-interventionist principles, right? So just make sure you're aware that those two schools preach for pure free market capitalism. Uh, in America, of course, we have Milton Friedman, uh, who was a Chicago school individual. We have Friedrich Hayek, who is an Austrian school individual. Their names are synonymous with the idea of non-interventionism and free markets. Um, supply side economics in juxtaposition to the idea of demand side economics, right? The idea of supply side economics is when you let the people who are the captains of industry keep their money instead of taxing them to death, what will happen is they will supply the economy with uh, that boost that it needs, right? With uh, investment in new businesses, investment in property, whatever it happens to be, right? When you let the rich be rich, the good fortune spreads to everyone or as Reagan would argue, it trickles down. Um, so supply side economics, Reaganomics and trickle down, these are all, uh, you know, uh, hand in hand with each other, right? Reaganomics, of course, is the name that was given to the economic policy of Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. And what did we see from Reagan in the 1980s? Sorry, I'm just going to adjust my camera here. There we go. What did we see? We saw privatization and deregulation become the order of the day at that time. When we privatize, we take something that used to be owned by government and then we pass it on to the free market, right? We basically cut government overhead uh, and we pass it on to the free market. The whole idea here, guys, when we privatize is that it will introduce competition to the market. And when you introduce competition, it will create innovation and it will lower costs. It will be a win-win for us, the consumer. It never actually happened, but it was a neat idea. Um, I, and of course, deregulation, right? This idea underneath here. Uh, is we remove red tape from business. We stop with the onerous um, you know, rules and things that they have to abide by in order to make their money. And then of course we have austerity as well. And I get to Thatcherism here in a second. Austerity means when government cuts social programs. And of course we saw that in the 1980s with uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, right? They both very much believed in austerity. Speaking also of deregulation, or sorry, privatization, uh, if you remember when we looked at Canada in the 1980s and early 1990s under Brian Mulroney, right? Canada had something like 60 crown corporations uh, and it sold 23 of them, including Air Canada and Petro Canada, right? And it passed it on to the free market. Um, okay, 
Thatcherism. Uh, it's named after the British Prime Minister from 1979 all the way to 1991. One Margaret Thatcher uh, referred to as the Iron Lady because she was steadfast in her beliefs about how to make Great Britain a strong, prosperous nation once again. And she basically embraced exactly what we saw under Ronald Reagan in America in the 1980s. We privatize, we deregulate, uh, and Guys, there was both good and bad seen in the British economy at that time. If you didn't look at those charts that I put up for Margaret Thatcher, where it looked at things like uh, the increase in poverty for the middle class, uh, decreased union membership, etc. Please make sure you have a look at those. Um, Laissez-faire, of course, I mean, we should know this at this point in this course, right? It means hands off, let it be, leave it alone. That is very much a capitalist ideal. Now, Moving down a little bit, some other terms that you should know uh, from this unit, right? Boom, bust cycle. Every seven to 10 years, we have periods of boom and bust in the economy. Uh, and there's numerous reasons as to why that happens. I'm not an economist. I just know that the economy has periods of yay and oh no, and then yay and then oh no. And it happens every seven to 10 years or so. Um, Subprime mortgage crisis, of course, guys, that began in 2007, 2008 in the United States. Um, re rules regarding mortgages were relaxed and people could now qualify for what were called subprime mortgages. And subprime means not prime, right? And these were people who had a demonstrated history of not paying their bills and then banks and mortgage um, brokerage houses were basically just handing out uh, the uh, mortgages to these people who had a demonstrated history of not paying their bills. And all this was possible because of the repeal of the so-called Glass-Steagall Act. Glass-Steagall Act was introduced uh, in 1933 under FDR and was to tighten up banking regulations as far as who qualified for mortgages, right? Lending rules, all these different things. And when that got repealed uh, in the late 90s under President Bill Clinton, it became a free-for-all for the subprime mortgage market. And it turned out kind of terrible, right? Collateralized Debt Obligation or CDO, um, this refers to how these subprime mortgages were packaged as triple A rated investments, meaning the best and the rating agencies who gave them these ratings were paid off to do so. Uh, and basically what happened is the risk of the mortgage, instead of it just being bank and that's it, right? Like usually guys, when a mortgage is given out, it's the bank who assumes the risk, right? They want to make sure they get their money. Um, but now that we have these investments being sold as great investments, right? AAA rated. Now the risk of that mortgage has been collateralized to anyone and everyone who buys these CDOs or these investments. And of course they weren't called CDOs, right? They're called that at the banks uh, or at the uh, finance uh, or investment firms that were selling them. Uh, but to us, they were called, you know, um, home equity, uh, market bonds or something like that, right? Like they gave them, of course, some euphemistic name to make them sound like they're great investments, the can't lose investment in real estate or something crazy like that, right? Um, anyways, yeah. So for something to be collateralized, it means it's spread out amongst many. And guys, please understand during the subprime mortgage crisis, I mean, pension funds for like, you know, teachers and nurses and Right, like all these different people invested into these uh, mortgage securities, as they were known as, and they lost hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially, or millions of dollars, billions of dollars. Right, in the end, guys, the subprime mortgage crisis cost the world economy twenty trillion dollars. Twenty trillion dollars just went poof, and it disappeared. And to fix the economic calamity that we saw during the subprime mortgage crisis, we, of course, uh, were given the Economic or Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, introduced by a young President Barack Obama, uh, and it's known as the bailout, right? Originally, it was like seven or eight hundred billion dollars, and in the end, guys, it 
ended up being more than a trillion dollars to shore up these companies like Bear Stearns, like um, uh, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, uh, all these companies that you know were selling these CDOs were then given a bailout of taxpayer money. The very people who were screwed by these firms selling these crap investments then were given public tax dollars so they could not fail. And the reason, again, guys, why they could not be let to fail was because if it did, it would have ushered in a second Great Depression, right? So Obama really was in a no-win situation. You bail out these companies who screwed people and basically you incentivize them doing this, or you don't, and you get criticized for allowing millions and millions of Americans to lose their jobs, to lose their house, to lose their stability. So he chose, I guess, in this case, the lesser of two evils, although nonetheless, it was still evil. And speaking of evil, the thing I really despise about the bailout was how Wall Street tycoons gave themselves bonuses after they ruined the economy. <laughs> Yay, capitalism. So what's the answer to all this, guys? I mean, I think more regulation, right? Um, I'm not saying we need an economy like the Soviet Union uh, or modern Venezuela because there's way too much government control there. Uh, same thing with Cuba. Uh, or North Korea, right? Not good. But I mean, guys, if this uh, doesn't demonstrate the need for some regulation in the economy, some sort of monitoring uh, to ensure that people play by the rules, I don't know what does. And when you combine that with the Great Depression uh, and the Herbert Hoover economy, where basically the government stepped in and did nothing during the Roaring Twenties, uh, and how also during the Industrial Revolution, how you know classical liberal laissez-faire was definitely the order of the day at that time, and how it led to massive social suffering. So maybe you know a little bit, right? I don't know how much, but we need some. We need more than we see in the United States of America. There's got to be a happy middle ground. And as I said to you guys in the last module, right? We need sort of that Goldilocks approach, not too hot, not too cold. We need a sort of just right amount. And what that is, I mean, we're still trying to figure it out, but I know it's not the USSR with total control. I, I know it's not America with no control because we've seen numerous times the economy just get crashed by shady people. Um, okay, anyways, guys, um, love you all and... Peace be with you all, and uh, we'll talk later, all right? See you guys.